The uh, Outlook sessions, uh, as the name suggests, is about thinking what, where are we heading, what's happening 2016 and beyond. And this panel is on global security. We had, as we started the World Economic Forum, a global security context session and uh, reflecting on uh, a few years that we now had behind us where we saw two trends developing uh, quickly and dramatically. The first trend is the trend towards increased fragmentation, loss of trust, loss of social cohesion. Many societies are unable to deal properly with uh, uh, governance, with maintaining political order and maintaining a sense of being in the same boat, which of course leads to a number of consequences, but in the more extreme version, uh, the rise of uh, violent extremism or the option for people with violent intent to capitalize on this fragility. And the opposite trend, which seems unrelated but actually is closely linked, is that we see between key powers on the planet an increasing competition over influence. At times that competition meets the areas of fragility in such a way that we see conflicts that are local, national, regional and global at the same time, connected between these two trends. We have a stellar panel with us and I will introduce them as they, as they give their first um, uh, intervention. I would like to start with uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO. Jens Stoltenberg, a former Prime Minister of Norway, has been here several times but it's the first time he's here as the Secretary General of NATO. Happy to have you with us. And one thing that we discussed in the previous session, which I think is very relevant for this one, is what we can call the blurring lines between war and peace, the complexity of actually understanding what is war and what is peace today. And I know you've been thinking about that as this is very relevant for your, your job now. What's actually happening and what is this word hybrid war that we're seeing more and more uh, on the agenda? I think it's, uh, what's actually happening is exactly what you said. That is, uh, before we had some kind of idea that it was either peace or war. But now more and more countries are living in a state uh, which is some, uh, in some way in between. And that is about this blurring line between uh, war and uh, peace. Uh, we see it uh, when we have frozen conflicts uh, many places in the world. We see it uh, when we have hybrid warfare, as we have seen, for instance, in Ukraine, with a mixture of military uh, and non-military means of aggression, with deception, with overt and covert actions. And of course, also terrorist attacks uh, is also a part of a, uh, a mixture of peace and, uh, and the war. And uh, especially when it comes to cyber warfare, uh, it's actually possible to wage war in a time of peace. And this is really creating some new challenges for uh, all of us and especially for uh, NATO. Uh, because we have to be agile, we have to be prepared, we have to be ready to be able to respond to a much more complex and uh, difficult uh, security uh, environment. And what we see is uh, to the east of the alliance, we see a more assertive Russia actually using hybrid warfare in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and to the south of the alliance, we see turmoil, terror, non-state actors posing also a great threat to uh, all allied uh, nations. And, uh, and NATO is responding. Uh, and, uh, and it's also great to uh, sit there together with uh, Secretary Ash Carter because uh, the U.S. is leading and it's great to have a Secretary of Defense which is so focused on the transatlantic uh, bond which uh, NATO represent, uh, represents. So, so our challenge is to respond to a more fragile uh, and more dangerous security environment. I will. Move further to Ashraf Ghani, the president of Afghanistan, an uh, old friend of the forum and uh, a person occupying probably one of the most uh, complicated jobs in the world, but still keeping an optimist approach. Um, you are in just in the middle of much of what we're talking about. And Afghanistan, unfortunately for the people of Afghanistan, has been there quite a while in, uh, in this intersection between fragility and competition. What, what have you learned? What are the things you will tell us about the security outlook from here and into the near future? Thank you. Well, the first thing is we need to understand that we are dealing with medium-term challenges, not short-term challenges. 
because if the challenge is not defined in the correct horizon term, we cannot put together strategies for containment and for overcoming. Second, terrorism morally reprehensible has become a sociological system. We need to understand it as an ecology where there's both competition and cooperation. Third, it, is, it has a distinctive pathology and it is directed towards theater. The attack on Paris, Istanbul, the rest. What's the purpose? To prevent us from freedom of travel, to make us suspicion of our neighbors, to call into question the very bond between the state and the citizen where the state protects the citizens. And lastly, it has a morphology. It changes very fast. It learns the techniques are transferable. In this environment, what is the other side of the ledger? The state system is weak. We are very privileged, and I'd like to thank both the Secretary uh, General and uh, Secretary Carter. The international level of understanding is remarkable, and let me pay tribute to all the men and women from 40 countries, but particularly from the United States who paid the ultimate tribute. We honor them. But the regional dimension is missing in action. Unless all the states in the region realize that this is a common threat and we need to get the rules and we need to cooperate with each other, we will be exacerbating. What cannot be permitted is for states to behave like non-state actors or to sponsor malign non-state actors. Last point, we're a people of resilience and we will overcome. Afghanistan will be the burying ground of Daesh and all the rest of them. Don't challenge us. <laughs> we have a proverb, revenge is sweetest when it takes place a hundred years. <laughs> Thank you very much. And before we go on, what do you see as the prospect for getting this regional alignment to deal with issues which are fundamentally transborder and can only be dealt with when countries cooperate? How are you doing? Well, the first issue is, at the global level, the news is good. 40 countries under uh, the very able leadership of the Secretary General and Secretary Carter have renewed their commitment in Afghanistan. Uncertainty is an enemy. Last year, part of our problem was that we had uncertainty. We had a year horizon. Once we've extended the horizon and the staying power is determined, strategies can be focused. Second, there's the question of differentiation. We need to differentiate each of the elements, each of the drivers of insecurity, and be able to deal with them. Thirdly, it is absolutely necessary to focus on the people. We cannot have corruption, we cannot have mismanagement, we cannot neglect the poor and the excluded. Anything that perpetuates misrule, bad governance, or exacerbates poverty. In here, markets are missing. The greatest missing element in the strategy of counterterrorism is the role of the market. Our greatest weakness is weak market institutions. And prosperity cannot be generated just from top down. It needs to be done with functioning institutions. So the private sector, my message to the private sector is, you can be great partners in this effort to create stability through creating pro prosperity. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let's move, uh, we'll, let's stay in Asia, but move uh, uh, to the Southeast to East Asia, to Singapore, Deputy Minister Tarman. Quite to the contrast of where Afghanistan comes from, Singapore is seen as one of the most stable uh, countries in, uh, in the region, but uh, you are not immune to the challenges that you are seeing and we were just discussing even in Singapore. Well, um, Singapore is the most religiously diverse uh, nation in the world. We have every major religion. Uh, the largest is only one third of the population. Mm -hmm. We have every major religion that is at conflict with another globally. Within our 720 square kilometers. Uh, for us, multiculturalism, multi-religious uh, multi compact uh, has been part of our identity 
and part of the rules of the game from the time we became a country. Because if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have survived. We wouldn't have survived. But we are not immune. And we are now having to work harder than ever before to preserve that compact, to keep that spirit of peace, tolerance, and more than peace and tolerance, that spirit of respect, that wanting to engage with each other in day-to-day -day life. The problem will be with us for a long time to come. I think we can't be wide-eyed about this. It'll be with us because even with the vast majority of Muslims in our region, not just in Singapore, but in our region, with the vast majority finding terrorism abhorrent and wanting to live in a multicultural context. Even with that being the case, we will face terrorism and that threat for a long time to come. Because 0.01% of 230 million people in our region is 23,000 people. And we know what 23 people can do. South Asia, about 350 million, if you're just taking the Muslims alone, and we're not counting the Hindus. That's 35,000 people. So the problem will be with us for a while, despite the fact that the vast majority find it abhorrent against their beliefs and the way they want to live their lives. Plus, I think we have to accept the fact that many of those who, have been, who are being converted to terrorist causes are now coming from the most advanced countries, from Western liberal democracies. And we are living with the legacy of decades of segregation and a culture of exclusion. Rules can be changed, but culture can't be changed quickly. This problem will be with us for a while, and it means that we have to take this as a long game, build resilience. We need to strengthen our defenses, and that's not just talking about the military, that's talking about the state needs strong powers of surveillance, it needs powers of preventive detention, and you need clear rules against hate speech. Those are compromises to preserve the larger liberty of living in an open society. We need some compromises backed by judicial authority, of course, not untrammeled state power, to preserve the larger liberty of living in a liberal society, open liberal societies. But more than that, far more fundamental, we've got to find ways of integrating people from the time they're kids to the time they're at the workplace, where they live, and everyone having that shared hope in the future. That's been central to our strategies, and we're working even harder at it. Mixed neighborhoods are critical. A workplace where you don't have an insider-outsider problem is critical. And most of our labor markets globally now still have an insider-outsider problem. And it's not, as the economists would say, just about incumbent workers versus new workers. The outsiders are the young immigrants and women. And if you're, if you're young and an immigrant and a woman, you're completely out. So the insider-outsider labor market is completely at contradiction with immigration, and we have to resolve that problem. Neighborhoods have to be mixed, job markets have to be open, and education has to be education for people, kids, in the same classroom together. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Secretary Carter, can we come back to the phenomenon of hybrid war? Sure. How has war changed? I think even over the very few last years, war appears as a somewhat different phenomenon than what we used to read about in the history books. Uh, yeah, I, I, first of all, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with everything my distinguished colleagues ha have said here. And uh, in another era, uh, in times past, uh, you know, perhaps a U.S. Secretary of Defense or a security official, a Secretary General of NATO, uh, were worried about and uh, committed to uh, preventing and succeeding, if it came to that, state-to-state -state conflict. And we still face that and the threat of that in, in many places. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is one uh, immediate example. But as has been said here, uh, and I don't expect this day to end as society grows more complex and interconnected and therefore essentially more vulnerable. And as destructive power falls into the hands of smaller and smaller groups of humanity, uh, this problem of the few against the many as a security issue, I expect to be with us for a long time. And so 
I, in, as I think about the future of the U.S. Department of Defense, as I do uh, in, in, all the time in addition to current operations, I, I, that's going to be a preoccupation of my successors, and our job is to deliver security to the people in the face of that fact. Now, it's, it kind of takes two, has two aspects to it, as has been said. Uh, one is terrorism, which is substate actors wielding that destructive power. Unfortunately, there are also states mm. that use the same instruments and the same vulnerabilities for more traditional purposes. And that's true whether it's little green men in Ukraine or, as to be uh, blunt about it and something we've objected to, uh, actors in China stealing intellectual property and uh, not being apprehended and stopped from doing it uh, in China, to uh, the Iranian government aiding Houthis or contributing to Hezbollah, this kind of thing also. That's what hybrid warfare uh, is. So there's, there's terrorism, substate, and hybrid warfare. Both of these are part of the security landscape, and we can't be vulnerable uh, to either of those. Now, when it comes to state um, uh, actors, uh, one has uh, some more traditional uh, tools available, and like our NATO alliance, we have to do things differently. We have a new playbook for NATO. It's not going to look like it did during the Cold War days, but still has to stand strong uh, for common uh, defense. But I expect this to be part of our responsibilities for a long time. Um, it is what we owe our people. Uh, that's why we're here. And, uh, and we can do it, but it's a very different kind of job from a w the way my predecessors way back uh, needed to do my job and these, these, these gentlemen uh, needed to do their jobs. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I think there's a common thread, actually, uh, in much of what we just heard, which is about the, the um, destructive power of relatively few people. And I think you, in the last session, you, in your conversation with Professor Schwab, you were touching on technology as the driver of that. And I think we have seen uh, in the book that he referred to, we have pointed out exactly this point, that technology makes it possible to inflict much more damage without having neither a big army nor a particularly sophisticated organization. And that means that, you know, once upon a time, if you had the biggest army, you were the strongest. So you, the large army would win over the weak army as long as the other one was not particularly sophisticated in tactics. Now this is changing. And that changes the authority of the state over other people. And I think that's a major uh, development across the board. And I think the other one is exactly this point that I think the President uh, Ghani said first, that states taking on elements of non-state actor behavior while at the same time we see non-state actors taking on certain behaviors like states, as the so-called self-proclaimed Islamic State or Daesh. And this, of course, creates um, a picture where looking into defense just by defense means is increasingly difficult. And what does that mean for, for the alliance, for instance? What does it actually mean for an alliance that is basically a military alliance with political masters? It means that we have to adapt, and that's uh, really what we are doing, and we have actually been doing that for uh, some time now. And uh, uh, for instance, we have to improve our intelligence, we have to improve our situational awareness, we have to improve our surveillance to be able to define exactly when we are under attack. Because in the all understanding of an attack, it was obvious. It was some kind of the idea of, uh, as a tanks rolling over from the Soviet Union attacking West Europe, then it was no doubt at all. But now when we have uh, cyber attacks and when we have different uh, kinds of uh, uh, hybrid warfare, little green men, then just to define when are we under attack requires more intelligence, more situation awareness, and uh, we will have much less uh, warning time. So one way of responding to this more blurred uh, line between uh, war and peace uh, is, uh, is uh, increased readiness, special operation forces, and more intelligence. And that's exactly what we are uh, investing in. I'm not saying that that's the whole answer, but that's part of the answer. Another part of the answer is to, of course, be willing and able to deploy large number of combat forces in big military operations as we have done in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, and many other places in the world before. But in addition to be able to do that also in the future, 
we are focusing more and more on how can we build local capacity or help countries uh, which are affected uh, themselves to increase their ability to defend themselves. And that's actually exactly what we now are doing in Afghanistan, because now NATO has ended our combat mission. So we now have 12,000 troops in Afghanistan who advise, train and assist the Afghans. Because in the long run, it's better that the Afghans themselves take care of their own security. We support them, but they are uh, in the front line. And uh, actually, for over one year now, uh, the Afghans have taken responsibility for their own security themselves. We will do the same. In, in, as we, we, are, we will start to train Iraqi soldiers. Uh, we give support to Jordan, to Tunisia, uh, exactly based on the same idea. We should project stability, not always by deploying our own combat forces, by, but by training uh, uh, re, uh, local forces, countries in the region, and enable them to defend themselves. And therefore, it's very inspiring to see the leadership of uh, President Ghani and, uh, and your, your tireless effort to make Afghanistan to a better place. And uh, I'm impressed every time I listen to you. President Ghani, the, the argument that um, Secretary, Secretary General Stoltenberg was just making is the argument for state capacity, and I think that has been your key theme from long before you became president, also in your academic background. Um, what could we be better at when it comes to building states that actually deliver not only security, but also the social cohesion, that the absence of which is the root cause of so many of these problems? And I'm not thinking necessarily Afghanistan, but as a global. No, absolutely. Well, the first thing is really to put the citizen front and center. What are her needs? And I'm deliberately picking my gender right. Because as long as we have exclusion of women, we're not going to get stability. It is imperative to understand that if we are going to have peace, and we must have peace, it cannot be at the exclusion of our women. Second is to make the, the efficiency argument. Singapore is a remarkable example of efficiency, but most state institutions are inefficient, and this is not acceptable. Terrorist organizations or learning organizations why are we failing to make state institutions into learning organizations? We are slow. We are bureaucratic in the wrong sense of the term. We are not responsive. We are not adapting quickly. So first point, a lesson of honesty. We need to analyze our weaknesses vis-a-vis -vis the enemy that we confront and master the political will. Political will is not an abstraction. It's a concrete set of steps to make choices between difficult options. It's not about, strategy is not about rosy projections. It is about moving the process forward, generating momentum. The other part of this, regional cooperation is an absolute must economically. We're delighted, for instance, to have a neighbor like Turkmenistan who is wagering on our future. Turkmenistan is just putting billions of its own money to build a pipeline through Afghanistan. That is the type of situation that makes an immense difference. And the other is to learn. Both Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan offer examples of how, from the depths of poverty, that the Soviet, the collapsing Soviet system, left to them, they've gone towards paths of stability. We need to appreciate and have the clarity of purpose to be able to learn from real examples. And again, key is to engage the citizens in an inclusive dialogue. I found, you know, I'm engaging continuously in town hall meetings across the provinces of Afghanistan. And what I learn in a single town hall meeting in a province is more than hundreds of meetings in Kabul. So government has to be taken out to the public. We need to take risks. If we hide ourselves behind walls, people will say, well, but they are away from us. 
the way, the same way that they could not build fortresses around our countries, the same way is to open the government. And I think in these regards, capacity can build. The other point, one other point. Capacity is not an abstraction. So a lot of the capacity building programs have been wrong-headed because they've focused not on what exists. They've focused on an abstract analysis of what does not exist. Mm. If we mobilize, instead of coming with plans that are made for Norway, we have to come with plans that are deliverable in Afghanistan or Kenya or somewhere else. Then you can really build, and Singapore again, off provides remarkable examples historically as to how they built a housing authority from scratch and kept building institution after institution to make this delivery point. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I would like to return to Deputy Prime Minister Tarman, but I'd also like us to move from this theme of fragility and state weakness to the opposite end of the scale, where you have strong states that compete and maybe compete even more. And some of that competition is happening in your neighborhood, not exactly in Singapore, but in, uh, but in the Southeast Asian and East Asian neighborhood, where we see a rising China and uh, also uh, other powers trying to balance the rise uh, of China. And some people have argued that these are in principle more dangerous developments than the developments we discussed first if they go wrong. So the point is, how do we keep them away from going wrong? I'll ask you and then also uh, Secretary Carter on, on that issue. Well, it's uh, just to follow on from your last point. It's a much lower probability event uh, conflict in the South China Sea or in Asia between different powers. Much lower probability, but if it happens, it has major consequence. Uh, whereas the problem we were talking about earlier of terrorism is not a very low probability. It's a very distinct probability and will also have major consequence for social cohesion uh, for a long time to come when it happens. Um, Asia is seeing a new balance of power. It's evolving year by year, decade by decade, and it's inevitable, uh, principally because the Chinese economy is now uh, much larger. In fact, it is the dominant trading partner for uh, virtually every East Asian country. It used to be the United States, it is now China. Um, this evolution in the balance of power, especially between China and the United States, uh, is, has so far been a peaceful, rebalancing. It will be uncomfortable at times, uh, and especially because we do not yet have trust between the United States and China. And that trust takes time to build. It takes time to build. It doesn't come because we sign agreements. It takes time to build through interaction, by testing each other and knowing how we each react, uh, and over time knowing that both sides deeply believe in peaceful coexistence. There are, from time to time, and this may be inevitable, uh, some uh, unilateral assertions uh, of power uh, without regard to international norms and rules. Uh, and every time that happens, uh, we have to shine a light on it and we have to insist on these matters being taken to international courts for international arbitration. Uh, that's the role of ASEAN. We are much smaller than the United States and China, but our interests are very deeply uh, uh, for a, a, a peaceful balance, a continued presence of the United States, and a balance of power that preserves peace in the region. And our role is not just to be neutral, but to be actively neutral. We're not passive. To be actively neutral, which means shining a light whenever there are these unilateral assertions that go against international norms or international law, and requiring that disputes be taken to the international courts. Thank you. Secretary Carter, um, it's an old military concept uh, to establish facts on the ground. In East Asia now, some actors have taken it to the next step, which is actually to build the ground itself, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, building on islands uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Balance of power or an upcoming confrontation? Uh, well, let me address that in one minute. I just want to commend my, the two, my the two preceding speakers, just if I may, uh, ends on, on the, um, uh, the concept of helping others. That's critical. 
one, our, it, a critical tool that we have is hardening other states so that they can protect themselves. That, in a sentence, is what we've been working with the Afghan security forces with. And, and, I, and President Ghani, for the idea of agility and efficiency in public incident, it's really critical. And that's why one of the reasons I'm here. It's critical that we not only be effective, but that we see, be seen as being effective. Now, I get to the to to Asia and the South China Sea. Everything that has been said is very uh, true. There is uh, China's rise is a major factor. It is a welcome factor to the United States in almost every way. Uh, and I'm not one of those people who believes that conflict between the United States and China is inevitable, certainly not desirable. I don't think it's likely. But this is, th you, you, these things are not automatic. You have to work for them. Uh, and uh, Chinese, China's rise is, by the way, not the only rise going on in Asia. India's a rising military power. Japan, if you haven't noticed, is a rising military uh, power. And there are others who are doing things, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, and so forth. Now, our point of view on that, uh, the U.S. point of view, is the same one we've had long standing, which is we welcome that. Uh, we've tried to create an environment there, and I, as I said earlier, I think we were the pivotal factor in making this so, in which over seven decades, essentially everybody could, could follow their own destiny towards prosperity. And that includes China. And, and we've never tried to obstruct China's uh, uh, economic rise and the lifting of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We've welcomed that, nor any of these other states we've talked about. At the same time, one has to, um, uh, 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 it, 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 we, we don't want to ruin a good thing, which is a system of peace and stability uh, there. So we intend to stick up for that. We're not separate, we're not dividing the region. We don't seek to ask people to take sides. We do know that people are coming to us increasingly. Why is that? It's because uh, China is taking some steps that I think are self-isolating, that are driving people towards a result that none of us wants, which is people coming to us and them feeling and being uh, excluded. One of those is the one you say. Now, I should, just to be clear, China's not the only one that's making uh, claims that we do not agree with, and they're not the only ones that are military outposts, and they're not the only ones who are doing out. We oppose all of that. And for our part, we have said everybody, not just China, but everybody who's doing that should stop and not militarize. That's, and, and second, for our part, we're going to keep doing what we've always done. We will fly, we will sail, we will operate everywhere international law permits in the South China Sea. I don't care what anybody else is doing. The United States Navy is going to do what it's done. The United States Air Force is going to do what it uh, would. So we will react, and we are reacting. We will make investments that are intended to sustain our military position despite these developments. Um, and we're helping other countries. They're all coming to us for assistance in mar maritime security. Uh, our alliances are strengthening with Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines, with other uh, long And we're building new relationships. You know, I've been to India, Vietnam uh, recently, and we want to have good relations uh, uh, with them. And we're not asking people to take sides, and I respect the position of strong and principled neutrality. The little Singapore, which is punches way above its weight morally, and in terms of influence in that region, uh, occupies. And I think their, their position is basically right, which is we want everybody to keep being able to do what they're doing. We don't want to have to pick sides. America doesn't want to have sides either. You know, at the same time, um, I think you have to recognize uh, self-isolating behavior. And when China engages in self-isolating behavior, that's what's, that is what is going to um, uh, uh, occur. But for our part, and you, you will see this reflected in the investments, the largest enterprise in the world, as Klaus earlier said it is, namely mine makes in coming years in its budget, and I'm preparing those budgets now, are specifically intended to deal with uh, these uh, challenges. So we will react. Uh, but it's not our preferred course to see self-isolating behavior by China. Uh, and, and yes, dialogue is the way uh, to do this, and uh, we, we hope for a, a better result. And I actually, uh, and as I said, I'm not somebody who's fatalistic about things. At the same time, 
We have to work for good results. I look forward to working with all my colleagues in the region, including the Chinese, to get an outcome that's a win, 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 win for everybody. Uh, that's what we've always stood for. Everybody rises. That's our philosophy. Sounds good. Um, Secretary General Stoltenberg, when you either as Secretary General of NATO or your colleagues who are Prime Minister, Defence Minister and Foreign Minister are discussing where to go, how do you, how do you properly judge between the issues, and I'm referring here to Deputy Prime Minister Tarman's point, that there are certain challenges which are there every day. Terrorism reminds of its existence on a weekly basis. And then you have these potential threats which are normally not occurring, which one may end up forgetting because they're not happening, and then only when they happen, you deeply regret that you didn't think about them. How can a political alliance in the proper way think the unthinkable while also managing the ongoing crises? Well, I think NATO has been quite successful in doing exactly that for uh, more than six decades because we have uh, both focused on managing crisis uh, and we have been, you know, in Balkans, in Afghanistan, and many other places managing uh, immediate crisis here and now. But at the same time, we have always had a long-term perspective of both being able to uh, adapt as uh, the security environment changes, but also, in a way, address the unthinkable, like, for instance, nuclear war. I mean, deterrence... Uh, to be strong is, uh, is part of what NATO uh, is doing because we believe that if we stay strong, then we are able to deter and actually uh, prevent war. The reason why we want to be strong is not to, uh, because we want to fight the war. It's because, because we want to prevent wars by being so strong that any adversary will understand that any attack on any NATO ally uh, is, 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 is uh, doomed to fail. So, uh, so that's the reason why we are adapting, and, uh, and I mentioned some of that ad adaptation already, but let me also remind you on the following facts, that we have tripled the size of the NATO response force. We have established a new spearhead or high readiness joint task force, which is able to, meet, uh, to move on very short notice. We have increased our military presence in the eastern part of the alliance as a response to a more assertive Russia. And uh, we are really focusing now on the new threats in cyber uh, and, and other kinds of, you know, hybrid, hybrid uh, threats. So, so, actually, I've been uh, Secretary General for a bit more than a year, and I'm impressed by the alliance, uh, its ability to adapt, mm -hmm. the, its ability to, 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 to respond to changing security environment, and that's also the reason why uh, this is a very successful alliance. And at the core of that alliance is the unity. 28 democratic nations. We have different views, we have many discussions, but we are able to then, by consensus, reach agreement, and then uh, there, is, there are very strong uh, conclusions when we uh, reach them uh, in, a, in a united way. Can I say something that he can't say, but that needs to be said? It also takes a really great Secretary General, and he's <laughs> absolutely fantastic, and we all love following his leadership. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I think our time is uh, up. Uh, if uh, one of you have uh, one final point that you were burning to make, I'll give you one last chance. I, it doesn't sound like that. I think that the, uh, that's a leading question, you know. <laughs> what I just want to say, you will see in the program of the World Economic Forum annual meeting and all our other activities that we place this issue much higher on the agenda than we used to do some years ago. And the reason behind that is not simply that we find it interesting, but we do feel that all these issues that we just discussed are so heavily interlinked with societal development, with economic development, that you cannot really say anything meaningful about where the world is heading without also understanding the major security trends. And thanks to the four of you for helping us to, to see that a little bit clearer. And, uh, uh, and that should conclude this session. And Mr. President Ghani remembered something anyway. Just pay a compliment. You know, partnerships are based on capacity for listening. And here I've had two fantastic partners who've had enormously productive dialogue where we focus on both definition of the problems and their solutions. And indeed, under their leadership, uh, we've been able to forge a way forward to see that we are not stuck in the past, but that we really have a pathway to the future. So again, compliments and let's give them a big hand. <laughs> Thank you to all of you.
session closed. Thank you.